Hello, my name is Zachary Stocks, and I'm the Executive Director of Oregon Black Pioneers. And my name's Ann Craig. I'm at the University of Oregon Museum of Natural and Cultural History. We have contracted with Oregon Heritage, our state's heritage office within Parks and Recreation, to promote a new tool for historic preservation of Black historic sites statewide. This tool is called the African Americans of Oregon Statewide Multiple Properties Document. Today, we'd like to introduce you to a few of the historic people and stories from Oregon's Black history from outside of the Portland Metro and discuss how the African Americans of Oregon statewide multiple properties document can be a resource for preservation and tourism for rural communities. While many of us have learned that Oregon's Black history began with the railroads or World War II era migrations to the Northwest, Black history here actually goes back centuries. The first arrival of non-native people in Oregon, non-native people of African descent in Oregon was in 1579 by English privateer Sir Francis Drake and the four enslaved and free black passengers who were with him, meaning that people of African descent have been a part of Oregon's cultural landscape for over 400 years, longer even than Virginia or Massachusetts. For the next several centuries, small numbers of black sailors, fur traders, and explorers made their way to Oregon in search of fur and gold. During the Oregon Trail years, the number of black overlanders was small, but grew gradually over time. Most were free, working for the white families that made the journeys west. A handful of black pioneers were enslaved. On the trail, black men and women, uh, excuse me, black men worked as wagon drivers and laborers, while black women worked as cooks and midwives. These travelers settled across the Willamette and Rogue River Valleys. Gold rushes after the Civil War brought hundreds of black men to mining camps in Jackson, Grant, and Wasco counties, and a brief coal boom in the 1890s brought about 200 black men, women, and children to Coos County. While a small number of black families settled throughout eastern and southern Oregon during the 1890s to 1910s, the arrival of the Transcontinental Railroad in Portland permanently caused the black population to be concentrated in Multnomah County. Black Oregonians are an important part of our state heritage, even in our most rural places. The unifying theme of rural Black Oregonians is grit, the determination to do something courageous, even in the face of great difficulty. And together with their neighbors, these Black pioneers helped to shape the identity of their rural communities. Historically, you can find examples of Black men and women in all of Oregon's traditional rural counties, excuse me, traditional industries and rural counties. Um, here are some examples. Uh, there's logging. This photo comes from Maxville in Wallowa County. Fishermen, longshoremen uh, in Coos County, as well as in the Columbia River, Clatsop County. Ranching in Grant County, Harnery County, Malheur County, all over. Uh, military service, of course, at uh, the many bases um, across the Pacific Northwest and in forts on the Columbia River. Mining, coal mining in particular in Coos County or gold mining in Southern Oregon. And farming, of course, uh, all over uh, every part of Oregon. And in addition to those traditional industries, Black Oregonians made history in academics, athletics, art and architecture, and of course, activism throughout the 20th century. On this slide, you see Mabel Bird. She grew up in Portland and made history as the first Black student to attend the University of Oregon in 1917, but she was denied campus housing because of her race. She ended up transferring to the University of Washington and later became a very well-known civil rights activist working in the US to further rights of African-Americans and working internationally with the League of Nations for Women's Rights. More than a decade later, Maxine Maxwell on the other side of the slide faced similar hurdles. She protested her placement in off-campus housing. Ms. Maxwell wrote a letter seen here to the Dean of Women at the University of Oregon in 1929, stating that it was not possible for her to accept the room that had been prepared for her and that she needed to consider her course of action. Maxine and her parents were the first to protest UO's policy of excluding Black women from dormitories. The responses from university staff and the local public 
captured the prevalent ra racist attitudes of the time. On the next slide, looking at athletics, again at the University of Oregon, Mel Renfro was an Oregon Duck. He excelled in track and football in the early 1960s. He went on to play professional football for the Dallas Cowboys for 14 years and became a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. While Renfro was at Oregon, the team traveled to Houston to take on Rice University in 1962. That Texas college lifted a ban, allowing African-American spectators just to accommodate Renfro's family. In the middle of the slide, we have Robert Moore, who became a football star, star at the University of Oregon, uh, going on to be the fourth round draft pick in 1972 and played for the St. Louis Cardinals, the Buffalo Bills, and the Minnesota Vikings. While with the Cardinals, Moore converted to Islam and changed his name to Ahmad Rashad. The Cardinals benched the star and Rashad confronted the organization with a play me or trade me ultimatum. The team relented. Rashad went on to become a popular sports broadcaster. And on the far side of this slide, we have University of Oregon track star Otis Davis. He won the 400 meter Olympic gold medal in 1960 at the Olympic Games with a time of 44.9 seconds. He was the first to run the event in under 45 seconds. And he anchored the gold medal team in the four by 400 meter relay. Looking at forward at art and architecture, this is DeNorval Unthink, one of the greatest 20th century Oregon architects. He was the first black student to graduate from the University of Oregon School of Architecture. And you can still see his buildings all over the state, um, including schools uh, in Lane County, the county court, courthouse and university buildings. Um, moving on to political ad activism, the Congress on Racial Equality, also known as CORE, was a national movement started by a group of students in Chicago. Other groups around the nation sprang up, including one in Oregon. And here you see Clyde DeBerry, who was the president of the Eugene CORE chapter and a faculty member at the University of Oregon, where he was the director for the university's desegregation training and research institute. He and others in CORE worked closely with the Montgomery bus boycott, boycott and Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Oregon did have a stake in the civil rights movement. So when we look at these stories um, and consider what do they have in common? In cities like Portland, Salem, and Eugene, Black Oregonians were discriminated against in business, housing, education, and more. Some left the state in search of more fair treatment and opportunities, and those who stayed developed tight-knit communities who supported one another. Here in Eugene, when celebrity groups like the Supremes and Louis Armstrong performed in town, they were not permitted to stay in local hotels. That was even following Oregon's 1953 Public Accommodations Act, which prohibited discrimination based on race. Instead, these performers had to lodge with local Black families like CB and Annie Mims and Sam and Maddie Reynolds. Today, the Mims house has a plaque in front of it. It's still owned by Annie and CB's son, Willie Mims. And today, it's home of the NAACP offices. So now let's talk more about some of these places. First, I want to start by discussing the National Register of Historic Places. So what is the National Register of Historic Places? It is the official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. Authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, the National Register of Historic Places is a program of the National Park Service. Its goal is to coordinate and support public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect America's historic and archaeological resources. Some examples, uh, there are over 96,000 properties listed on the National Register, including about 2,000 in Oregon. Here on screen are a couple of examples. Uh, on the left is an image of the Baldwin Hotel in Klamath Falls. On the right is the Bank Building in Echo in Echo, Oregon. Having a site listed on the National Register of Historic Places offers benefits to property owners and to communities. Sites listed on the National Register are eligible for federal grants offered by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and a number of state grants offered by each state's State Historic Preservation Office. Property owners can also take advantage of certain tax incentives available for easements and for rehabilitation. Communities also benefit from local sites on the National Register by marketing their historic properties as part of heritage tourism and education efforts. 
But unfortunately, sites on the National Register of Historic Places are largely concentrated in the East and in urban areas. Oregon's extensive history is not adequately reflected by sites included on the National Register of Historic Places. Also, sites on the National Register lack diversity. The program favors structures for their architectural significance more often than for stories which they represent. Because of this, there are not nearly enough sites dedicated to the historic experiences of people of color, women, immigrants, or LGBTQ communities. So when we look at traditional listings for the National Register, here's some examples from around the state. Um, you might recognize the French Glen Hotel outside the Steens Mountain area. Um, we also have Dee Dee Hall uh, at the University of Oregon, which has since been uh, denamed to University Hall because of the namesake's racist behavior. We have a private home in Eugene, up uh, the, the blue house up on the top right-hand corner. It was put on the register for its excellence as a craftsman style home. Um, also pictured is the Joel Palmer House and Shirk Ranch um, in Lake County. But when we look at Black history in Oregon, we're looking at a very different type of property. This is a great example. So earlier this year, Dean's Beauty Salon and Barbershop was added to the National Register. It opened in 1956 in the Lower Albina area of Portland. It was a fixture in the historic Black neighborhood, and it continues to operate today among the longest continuously operating Black-owned businesses in Portland. Since it, its heyday, it, the neighborhood has changed. It now is home to more whites than Blacks, but Dean's continues to be a reminder of the strength and resilience of the community. The designation of Dean's Barbershop is particularly important because it applies new thinking to an old system. We often think of places on the historic register as pristine examples of original architecture, like those pictured in the slide before. But in this case, architecture is not the primary reason the site is listed. The quote on the screen here from Brandon Spencil Hartle, who is a city planner important helping to get the building listed, explains it well. It's not just about the buildings you can see from the sidewalk, but about the people who have occupied them. Now this project um, we're undertaking, the multiple properties document, is looking to identify places like Dean's Barbershop across the state. This project is not involving the Portland area. So in 2019, um, th this takes over from a project that started in 2019 that did a multiple properties document recognizing those areas in Portland. The MPD allows multiple sites or structures to be nominated to the National Register as a group by recognizing the historical significance of the story that unites them. The MPD for African-American Historic Sites in Portland was approved in 2021 and has been used to successfully add Dean's Barbershop and Beauty Salon, the Billy Weld Elks Lodge, and the Golden West Hotel. Last year, Oregon Heritage earned a grant from the National Park Service to conduct a statewide survey, survey of African-American historic places. The goal for this MPD is to highlight places associated with Black individuals and stories from outside Multnomah County. Stories are an especially important uh, part of documenting histories of communities of color because these stories are less likely, less likely to be preserved in written sources or with standing structures. These stories can form the basis of preservation efforts and contribute new knowledge about our state's heritage. Here's an example about how an MPD can work to preserve sites associated with the story of Operation Firefly. In 1945, the 555th, popularly known as the Triple Nichols, received a unique assignment. The Japanese had begun dispatching balloon bombs from the Pacific Ocean to land and detonate on the West Coast. On May 5th, 1945, a family was killed by such a bomb in the town of Bly. The incident represents the only home front combat casualty of World War II. The Japanese would eventually launch over 9,000 balloon bombs in an attempt to start out of control wildfires and draw American resources away from the Pacific front. The Triple Nickels were sent to the West Coast for what was called Operation Firefly. They were to train as smoke jumpers and put out remote wildfires caused by Japanese bombs. 
To do this, the men would jump from planes and drop into forest lands where they could extinguish the blazes on foot. 200 of the Triple Nickel's 300 enlisted men trained at Pendleton Airfield, where the U.S. Forest Service taught them the work of smoke jumpers. In just that one summer, members of the Triple Nickel's had over 1,200 jumps. The unit was deployed to extinguish 36 fires in Oregon, Washington, California, and Alaska. Malvin Brown was one of the men serving in the 555th. He was from Baltimore and had enlisted in the Army's Airborne Unit in Philadelphia in 1942. He was a private first class and a medic in 1945 when he and the other Oregon Triple Nichols engaged in their long summer of firefighting. On August 6, 1945, a fire was reported in the Umpqua National Forest. Brown and eight others were assigned to the blaze, which was burning along a high tree-lined ridge near Lemon Butte. After jumping and landing in a tree, Brown began lowering himself to the ground with his rope. Tragically, Brown fell and landed in a ravine 150 feet below. He died instantly. His fellow soldier recovered his body and pressed on, carrying him more than 12 miles to the pickup point and through thick smoke. Malvin Brown was the first smoke jumper to die in the line of duty and the only member of the Triple Nickels to die during Operation Firefly. Because of discrimination, the story of Black World War II veterans were not as celebrated as the stories of white soldiers. The Triple Nickel story still remains largely unknown, even in Oregon. Today, the Oregon State Historical Markers Program has erected markers in Pendleton and near Cave Junction to tell the story of the 555th. The Bly bombing site, Pendleton Airfield, and the Ridgefield, where Malvin Brown died, could all qualify for the National Register of Historic Places under an Operation Firefly multiple properties document. And that's such a great example. Um, because these sites in rural areas and sites to pertaining, pertaining to people of color are underrepresented across the National Register, the statewide African-American MPD is an especially valuable tool for acknowledging these hidden histories of Black Oregonians, especially outside of the Portland metro area. So one of the most common refrains we hear as we've been working on this project is, why are we doing a special project on just Black history in rural Oregon? because there are so few Blacks in Oregon. And I would say this mindset is really common and it's very problematic. There are hundreds of stories of Black Oregonians. We've shared just a couple of them here today that have helped shape the state, but because they haven't been documented, shared and preserved in the same ways as white histories, um, it furthers that incorrect understanding that Blacks are not a significant part of Oregon's history. They have to be uncovered, shared, and preserved so we can better understand all of Oregon history. These stories are stories of perseverance, for sure. So here's just an image of um, you know, how we're going about this project, the, the uh, instructions. So it requires a, a historic context statement and a list that we have of historic sites. We have about 70 so far, and they span near, nearly every county in Oregon, and they cover over 300 years, including Sir Francis Drake's landing in 1579, and all the way up through the years of the Civil Rights Movement, years that some of you watching may have lived through. For example, one of the possible sites to be nominated is a church in Eugene, where members of the Corps would gather to plan and organize civil rights activities. They were making history, um, maybe not planning on it, but it's our job today to uh, preserve those stories. Now I'd like to discuss Sybil Harbor as an example of an historic black figure from outside of the Portland Metro, whose significant stories could be considered for preservation under the National Register for Historic Places. Sybil Harbor was born in Missouri in 1856. At some point, she moved to California where she was living when she gave birth to her son, Bert, in San Joaquin County in 1872. In 1886, Bert found work in Oregon and moved to Lakeview. Sybil followed two years later, living in the home of a white family she had worked for while still in California, who had also relocated to Lakeview. Sybil made a living doing housework and cooking, and then she opened a bakery, but it burned down in 1900. Afterwards, she made a living by converting her home into a boarding house. She turned to midwifery and operated a nursery for newborns there. 
Harbour became widely known for her midwifery and country doctor skills and was apparently keen at confirming pregnancies. Lake County had no hospital, so locals relied on Harbour to deliver babies and tend to the sick. According to Lakeview Museum historian Jennifer Carroll, quote, Aunt Sib's nursery was not only for maternity cases, but for sick people. In 1913, she helped nurse my own father for about three weeks. In fact, I think surgery was performed in her house. Sybil Harbor's diverse and important work made her a respected member of the community, supporting local events and caring for local children, end quote. In 1915, Sybil became ill with uterine cancer. She moved to Salem to receive treatment, but did not recover. She died in Marion County in 1918 and is buried in Salem's Pioneer Cemetery. Sybil's positive impacts to the Lakeview community between the 1880s and 1910s is a perfect example of the kind of stories which the African-American Multiple Properties document is meant to recognize. Any structures older than 50 years old which have a connection to Sybil could be considered for recognition under the National Register of Historic Places. So how can you help preserve uh, Oregon's historic sites? To start, we need local residents to help share their stories and knowledge about local Black history. It's our team's job to dig into those histories and those stories and make sure the experiences of people in that story are represented. Once the multiple properties document is completed, hopefully in 2023, individuals across the state will be able to use the document to nominate places in their communities they feel are significant to Black history. This could include a crowdsourced information campaign and public events and workshops. The multiple properties document is for all of Oregon because it helps us understand how and who has built this state. So the next steps for us, um, as I said, we hope to submit it in 2023, but the research is going to be far from over. The MPD is just the beginning. Every community has stories and these are often well known by longtime residents, but they haven't been documented or recorded. So it's important to include these stories, understanding that larger picture and getting the full picture of Oregon as a state. So we would love to hear from you. If you have information that you'd like to share about African-American historic sites near you, or if you have questions about the multiple properties documents or the process or about the National Register of Historic Places, please feel free to contact either of us using the email addresses you see on screen here. And there are more resources available about the National Register uh, by following the links that you see on screen. Thank you very much. We hope to hear from you.